Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Gerhard Kasper, the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I welcome you uh, to tonight's uh, lecture. Now, uh, my main function is to do the following, to tell you that Roxana Margheriti, the Nina Maria Gorison Fellow at the American Academy, will be introduced by Professor Flood, who is a Keenan Professor of the Humanities at NYU and at present a Fellow at the Wissenschaftskolleg. We have a couple of other people from the Wissenschaftskolleg here tonight, and we are just delighted. So I'm permitted to say three words, kind of, about Professor Flood. Born in Dublin, Barry Flood studied, now listen carefully, he studied mental and moral science at Trinity College, a wonderful designation that reminds us of an empiricist period when philosophy and psychology were viewed as closely related. I checked it out today, and unfortunately, they have dropped this designation. So you are actually not related to the philosophy department at Trinity College at all. You are of a past that has gone forever. <laughs> Barry Flood also studied classical archaeology at Trinity College and art history at Edinburgh. At present, he is working on Islam and image. For all those, and that includes my wife and me, who during their travels to India have worried, wondered about the Hindu-Muslim entanglements in India, Princeton published in 2009 his much-admired book, Objects of Translation, Material Culture and Medieval Hindu-Muslim Encounter. But he will not speak about that tonight. He will only speak about Roxani. As the representative of a bygone era, um, it's a great honor and a pleasure to introduce Roxani Margheriti. People always say this, but it really is a great honor and a pleasure to introduce Roxani Margheriti, whose work over the past decade or so has done so much to advance our understanding of the complex and highly cosmopolitan economic, social, and trade networks connecting the world of the medieval Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, and the Mediterranean. The very cosmopolitanism and heterogeneity of this world demands a wide range of disciplinary and linguistic skills to begin to understand it. And Roxani Margheriti is one of the very few contemporary scholars with those skills. Skills that she's used to great effect in a range of publications which show a rare fluency in fields ranging from numismatics and textual analysis to um, onomastics. <coughs> Roxani Margheriti is Associate Professor of Middle Eastern Studies at Emory University in Atlanta, whose faculty she joined in 2002, having received her PhD from Princeton University. Her research interests include, the Middle Eastern, uh, include Middle Eastern social and economic history, maritime history and archaeology, material culture and urban studies, on all of which she's published. The chronological focus of much but not all of her work is on the crucial centuries, I'm slightly biased in this respect, I mean, <laughs> the crucial centuries before the advent of European colonialism, with a particular focus between, on the period between the 11th and 13th centuries, a period very dear to my own heart. Roxani has participated in numerous archaeological excavations and surveys in England, Greece, Turkey, Oman, and the UAE and has served as assistant to the curator of Islamic and East Asian coins and medals at the American Numismatic Society in New York. And I, I would say that she's somebody who is peculiarly, given the fields that she works in in between, peculiarly sensitive to the importance of numismatics. Um, she also served as senior assistant and editor of medieval Judeo-Arabic manuscripts at Princeton University's uh, S.D. Goitain Laboratory for Geniza um, research. The Geniza documents, I'm sure most of you know, is this incredible trove of documents found in the synagogue of Fustat um, in the 19th century, which have shed so much light on um, the Jewish community and its centrality to trade networks between South India, Arabia, 
um, the Red Sea and the Mediterranean in the 11th uh, through 13th centuries. These included, the Geniza documents from Fustat, included letters from Jewish traders resident in medieval South India, um, which have been a consistent feature of her research. I mean, again, one of the things I would say that she has done is really take these documents and uh, really maximize the amount of information. The way in which they have been uh, mobilized in her work is truly extraordinary. Her first book, entitled Aden and the, in the Indian Ocean Trade, 150 Years in the Life of a Medieval Arabian Port, was published in 2007. It's a study of urban topography and commercial institutions at the Yemeni port of Aden, a key node in the Indian Ocean trade from the 11th to 13th century, not to push the point, but 11th to 13th century. <laughs> it was, to put it bluntly, a game changer in the world of Indian Ocean studies. It's really a landmark study. She is, in addition, co-editors of two volumes of collected essays, Histories of the Middle East, Studies in Economy, Society and Law, in honor of A.L. Udovich, published in 2010, and Jews, Christians and Muslims in Medieval and Early Modern Times, a fish shift in honor of Mark or, or R. Cohen, which was published recently in 2014. Recent articles, and I'm not going to talk about all the articles, just two that, that really seem to me um, in, very, very important. Recent articles include a foundational study of coins and commerce around the Western Indian Ocean, published in an edited volume called Trade and Religion in World History that was co-edited by Lior Halavi, my fellow fellow from the, from the Vico, who's here tonight. In my opinion, this is one of the best essays ever published on the Indian Ocean world. Taking as its focus the wide range of coinage and coin types that grease the wheels of commerce around the Indian Ocean littoral, the essay engages questions of cultural, economic, and linguistic translation in a way that goes well beyond the normal range of questions asked of either numismatic or textual data. In moving from the coins carried by merchants and sailors across vast distances to the protocols of commensuration that underwrote their efficacy as instruments of exchange, the essay demonstrates two complementary hallmarks of Roxani Margariti's scholarship. First, its close attention to detail, its inability to leave any stone unturned in its pursuit of more complex understandings of the past. And, just as important, its deep commitment to reconstructing the bigger picture, to moving from that coin in the pocket to much larger, more complex cultural processes. This deep commitment to reconstructing the bigger picture from the fragmentary artifacts and texts that have come down to us from the period, and all of us who work in this period are aware that we're dealing with flotsam, with random survivals that have happened to come down to us and trying to reconstruct these larger cosmopolitan histories from these random survivals. Indeed, it is the commitment to the study of both texts and things, artifacts and archives, that distinguishes the scholarship of Professor Margariti. Roxani Margariti's current project here at the American Academy, focuses on islands, insularity, and the biography of the Dahlak uh, archipelago in the southern Red Sea, a series of small islands located off the coast of modern Eritrea through medieval and early modern times. I have to say that when I first read um, about the project, I would have been thrilled to hear that anybody was working on the history of Dahlak, but to have Professor Margariti focusing on the topic promises great things ahead. Now, I realize that a capacity for excitement about a small group of islands generally unknown outside the region may seem like the passion of a geek. But <laughs> if so, I'm confident that we can boast a quorum of Red Sea and Indian Ocean geeks here tonight. <laughs> On a more serious note, I think the work promises to be groundbreaking for two reasons. First, it promises to nuance our understanding of the medieval Indian Ocean world by drawing attention to the importance of the Red Sea region and its ports, both as a commercial and cultural region in its own right and as a conduit between the Indian Ocean and Mediterranean worlds. And one of the, the historiographic problems with the Red Sea, I think, is that it's tended to get lost in the space between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean um, Sea and without fully being acknowledged as a major cultural uh, and economic zone in its own right. 
Although generally forgotten, except by us committed Greeks, the sultans of, the sultans of Dahlak were major brokers in the Indian Ocean trade, brokers who in my own work I've suggested were key players in mediating the passage of Indian goods as far inland as highland Ethiopia in the 11th through 13th centuries. The second reason why I think this will be groundbreaking is um, came from reading a preliminary outline of the project that was published by Roxani in a 2010 article entitled Thieves or Sultans, Dahlak and the Rulers and Merchants of Indian Ocean Port Cities, 11th to 13th Centuries. This suggests that the project that she has now embarked upon will offer a significant challenge to the dominant view espoused by myself and others, that there was little attempt to exercise dominion over the maritime trade routes before the imposition of European hegemony from the 16th century. I think she's beginning to work against this in looking at um, the sultans of Dahlak. In other words, the work promises to be mold-breaking and controversial in the best possible sense. On a personal note, I want to end by saying that while I generally read the burgeoning publications on the medieval Red Sea and Indian Ocean regions diligently, and we're in an era where there seems to be endless publications appearing every week and one does one's duty and one reads them. But it's very rare, I would say, um, that I anticipate the publications of a scholar with excitement and interest and passion. Um, and when it comes to Roxani Margariti, um, I anticipate any publication from her, not simply with appropriate diligence, but with great excitement and enthusiasm. And so I'd ask her to deliver tonight her lecture entitled The View from Water's Edge, Red Sea Islands and Indian Ocean History. Thank you so much, Barry, for this lovely and very generous introduction. Um, Oh boy, I have a lot to live up to right now, uh, which is making me more nervous. But I'm very honored that you could be here. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Gerard, for presiding over tonight's event and for presiding over this um, island of friendship and knowledge in general. And I, before I start, I have a few more words of thanks. Um, as the Nina Maria Gorison Fellow in History, I would, I'm very grateful to Nina Maria Gorison uh, for her support uh, of the Fellowship in History um, and the Academy in general. I would also like to thank the entire staff um, at the American Academy for their constant support, their generosity, and their kindness, and for doing so much of what's made these uh, past two and a half months uh, some of the most productive and um, enjoyable I've had. For the preparations of tonight's events, I would like to uh, thank particularly and very much uh, Tina, Joachim, Simone, Rudiger, Christina, Reinhold, Stefan, Matthias, Gabi, Noel, Julio, Daniel, uh, Yolanda, Laura, and Lutz. And finally, I want to express my gratitude to my fellow fellows. Um, I'm very honored and very inspired by um, your intellectual companionship, and I'm also very thrilled to be discovering uh, this great city uh, with you and through your eyes. All right. This week, a letter arrived from Al Mahsar. In it, he said, that he was shipwrecked at Dahlak Island and that he did not lose any of his merchandise except some trivial things he had with him. But the gold and the copper are safe. With him was Musa al wadami and Fairuz, and they're all safe, praise be to God. Written on a now stained and torn piece of 12th century paper, this fortuitously preserved fragment of a business letter reports on the hazardous progress of travelers down the Red Sea, perhaps the most important maritime corridor of medieval transregional trade from the 10th century onward. The writer, an Arabic-speaking Jewish businessman from somewhere in the Mediterranean, 
had himself made it down the Red Sea and out into the Indian Ocean and the port city of Aden, a major hub of trade and information of the so-called India trade, as we just heard. After reporting on routine business transactions conducted there partly on behalf of his correspondent, our author conveys news of our people, fellow Jewish merchants, most of them co-religionists traveling the Eastern Seas. The particular subject of his report, Abu Ishaq Ibrahim ben Halabu, was thought lost at sea along the Red Sea route, leading from Cairo and Alexandria and the entire Mediterranean, down the Arabian and Iranian seaboards, and ultimately to India, until a letter arrived from him detailing his shipwreck near the island of Tahlak and the relatively happy ending. This otherwise mundane document of daily life that enclose, thus encloses a dramatic story, the protagonists of which would have been unknown today except for an accident of document preservation. The letter and the story in it raise a series of questions about the economic and social structures at play in transregional trade. The financial and legal instruments available uh, to the participants of long distance commerce, the organization of navigation in an age of limited technical means, the business of shipping, including boat building, salvage, um, and uh, maritime rescue, the identities of the participants, the political economies involved, and ultimately about the historical source itself. How and with what sources can we write the history of ordinary life in the distant past that elaborate chronicles and grand monuments, the things that usually get preserved, generally don't tell? I am here at the American Academy this spring uh, to research a book about social and economic history at the insular crossroads of the Red Sea's Dakhlak Archipelago from the 10th to the 16th century. And tonight, I want to share with you the rationale behind the central theme uh, of the book and a concrete sense of how it applies to illuminate the history of the place and period in question. So first, a few words about uh, place and time. The letters Dakhlak Island, where the shipwreck and rescue of Abu Ishaq took place, is the largest island of the remarkable homonymous archipelago in the, rather, in the southern Red Sea. So right here, um, and this is the main island. Some 200 islands today in the territorial waters of the state of Eritrea. And in medieval and early modern, in the medieval and early modern periods that I'm interested in, part of the Abyssinian Ethiopian Habashi uh, realm. Ranging from the very large to the very tiny, the islands are low-lying coral formations sitting on, a geological, on geological salt domes that give them their distinct maritime topography, a maze of deeps and shallows and landing places that are spread over 3,000 square kilometers and require considerable local knowledge to navigate. In spite of a notoriously harsh climate, the island's biodiversity is remarkable and includes a variety of unique and uniquely maritime resources of significant economic value, both to the traditional economic life of the islanders and to transregional trade in the past. Mangrove and coral, both of which make important uh, construction materials, food sources such as fish, mollusks, olothurians, and a phenomenal variety of bird species. And for the transregional aromatics and decorative arts manufacture, ambergris, tortoise shell, and pearls renowned since antiquity. Now, who are the islanders and where do they come from? Historically, sailors, captains, merchants, fishermen, pearl divers, and herders, today's population of about 3,500 people are also native speakers of at least three languages. Oops, there we go. Afar, uh, which is an uh, African Cushitic language, Arabic, and Dahalic. 
Tahalik, a language indigenous here, suggests a complex social evolution, including a process of creolization at some as yet unspecified historical period, and is therefore a testament to both the intense connectivity of the archipelago with the Arabian and African coasts and the long continuous history of habitation here. Of this long history, I have chosen to focus on the maritime polity based here in three consecutive historical periods that saw the acceleration of exchange between the Indian Ocean um, and Mediterranean networks of trade and politics, and ultimately the creation of a global system of exchange. In each of these periods, one or more distant states and various networks of traders extended their reach toward the crossroads of the Southern Red Sea. Between the 10th and 12th centuries, the Shia Fatimid dynasty from its seat in Cairo sent traders and missionaries to the kaleidoscopic polities holding on to different parts of Yemen and Ethiopia. And in response, the Dakhlakis purveyed maritime and market services and played a delicate political game. From the 13th to the 15th centuries, the ruling Mamluks of Egypt and the Levant and the Rasulid sultans of Yemen received prestige gifts from the islands and at times projected claims of sovereignty over them. After a short hiatus in the documentary evidence, the 16th century saw the reappearance of Dakhlak on both physical and mental maps of outsiders. Part of a new vision of universal empire evinced both by the Ottomans and the Portuguese, this outsider's intervention in the Southern Red Sea contrasts with earlier modes of engagement between larger states and smaller maritime polities in a number of ways, not least of all in terms of the generalized and ideologically tinted uh, uh, mode of violence. Not that there was no violence before, as we just heard, but um, there, there was a difference in this period. But in each of these three periods, the small polity centered at Dakhlak reacted and adapted to the economic pressures and opportunities presented by the regional and transregional realities, a story that tells us quite a bit about how people across the region experienced those momentous events. So moving from this uh, quick geohistorical summary to island history and the concept of insularity that serve as the main themes uh, of my hopefully future book. The Judeo-Arabic letter we started with, with a glimpse of the medieval trader's deliverance after hardship at sea, remind, reminds us that in the histories of human migration, long distance travel and circulation, Islands feature prominently, and insularity plays important and varied roles. Although focusing on the medieval and early modern past, the history and human stories I try to tell conceptually intersect with and are illuminated by the stories of islanders and people on the move in different historical periods and parts of the globe. Not least of all, those living the drama of forced human migration in the Mediterranean and other seas today, for whom islands are landings, stepping stones, refuges, sometimes detention centers and prisons, while for others, the islanders who receive them, these same islands are home. What I intend to do in the rest of my lecture is first expand on the question of island history, how it intersects with what we might call Indian Ocean history and historiography, and why I find these frames useful for understanding connected histories, meaning the story of the islanders of the Dakhlak archipelago and overlapping histories in the Mediterranean, the Indian Ocean, East Africa, the Middle East, and the Islamic world. And second, I would like to give you a few concrete sketches of Dakhlak's local, regional, and trans-regional history and how different kinds of sources generated inside, but mostly outside the archipelago, can contribute to our understanding of these three registers of human experience there. So first, Indian Ocean history and historiography, and specifically what we might call thalassography, or studying history from the point of view, from the vantage point of the sea. So why Indian Ocean history and not Middle Eastern history, Islamic history, Eritrean or Ethiopian history, or, or, or East African history? 
Conceptual frameworks that have consciously or subconsciously defined geohistorical units in terms of modern national state boundaries or modern area studies divisions generate rigid and surprisingly tenacious habits of thought, what historian Karen Wigan and geographer Martin Lewis have described as meta-geographies. With these come stereotypes that we often mistake for geographical and geopolitical inevitabilities. This is how overcoming such divides affects my case study of history at the Dahlaks and their immediate forelands um, in Arabia and East Africa. Located in the Middle East and East Africa respectively, uh, conceived respectively as Muslim and Christian, the histories of Yemen and Ethiopia might appear to belong in different universes. But as scholars have purposefully elided the continental divide, and zoomed in and looked around to land and water together to have exposed a long connected history, one that even goes back in deep time to the earliest migrations in human history as recent paleontological findings along the shores of the Red Sea have shown. For the purposes of my work, this perspective gives us a, a new frame. The immediate region of the islands is the Southern Red Sea with Yemen and Ethiopia, Arabia, and uh, the Horn of Africa being the island's immediate foreland. In a circle of more attenuated but still formative connections, a second geographical register stretches from Western India and um, Indian Ocean East Africa to the Mediterranean shores of Egypt. Thalassography, the study of history again from the vantage point of the sea, is one way to provide relief from such false binaries as it highlights connectivities and circulation rather than roots and essences. The most influential pioneer of the thalassographic approach, the great French historian Fernand Brodel, turned late 16th century European history on its head, focusing not on the great men of that well-known history, but rather on the long-term structures that governed life for the majority of people living along the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. This is how he famously put it, cutting through the binary of very weighty historiographical, uh, historical and historiographical pedigree, the binary of Ottoman versus European history, and of the Muslim versus the Christian Mediterranean. And I quote, the Turkish Mediterranean lived and breathed with the same rhythms as the Christian. The whole sea shared a common destiny, a heavy one indeed, with identical problems and general trends, if not identical consequences." End of quote. Now there are problems with generally asserting unity for a vast geohistorical space, such as the Mediterranean. Brodel's most recent followers and sometimes critics, Peregrine Horden and Nicholas Purcell, in their formidable and dense opus, cleverly point out that the Mediterranean's unity consists, in fact, in its extreme environmental fragmentation, its division into microregions, relatively small and bounded parcels of landscape that become interconnected and interdependent through human exchange. The problem of unity is even more pronounced for the Indian Ocean, where the Brodelian frame has taken hold, as is clear in Kirtinilanda Chaudhary's standard survey of Indian Ocean-centered history, with the ambitious scope of covering trade and civilization in the Indian Ocean from the rise of Islam to 1700. Here, the notion of a more or less uh, smooth geohistorical continuum is even more problematic as this most ancient of oceans is a physically much larger and open-ended oceanic realm in a way that makes the connections and connectivity less dense and more uneven across space and time. So when I talk about the Indian Ocean, you will notice that I am referring mostly to the northwestern part of that continuum. So this is the realm that I'm talking about. Moreover, I find that focusing on regions and even smaller units, case studies of specific islands or insular entities, sort of middle range regional uh, places, is a way of exposing the strands of connectivity that make the broader geohistorical unit meaningful. Okay, so on to islands. In a particularly poetic for you pages of uh, Brodel's aforementioned work, 
She pursues the argument that Mediterranean islands fulfill multiple roles crucial to the articulation of the world they belong to. They are, he says, microcosms, miniature continents, stepping stones, pirate layers, anthropos, navigational landmarks, sources of commercially recognizable brand goods, and places of origins of laborers and other people on the move circulating throughout this world for different reasons. The islands of the Indian Ocean have received much less attention than those of the Mediterranean, but are just as productive to think with. The idea that the connectivities of the transregional systems are encapsulated in the figures of islands is a very old one and, in fact, contemporary with the medieval and early modern islands I'm interested in, not just a construct of modern scholars. In this beautiful map illustrating the celebrated 12th century geographical compendium of uh, geographer Mohammed Alidrisi, the Eastern Ocean is a gulf of islands right here. And please note also the um, usual perspective of Islamic cartography, uh, which challenges our own arbitrary emphasis on the north. So what we have here is the south on top, the north down here, and then you can recognize really pretty recognizable the Mediterranean with Arabia very nicely outlined in the center and uh, the Indian Ocean right there. And take a look at this, the earliest map of the Indian Ocean, part of a remarkable Arabic geographical and cosmographical uh, treatise composed in Egypt in the 11th century. The logic of this map is obviously not to represent space proportionally and realistically, but rather to provide a kind of bevege uh, map showing how different points <laughs> showing how different points in a network of itineraries are connected to each other. The main point that stands out here is the prominence of islands. Even more than the color green, they represent the sea, specifically the sea as a medium for connectivity. Coining the concept of Indian Ocean Africa to highlight uh, East Africa's connectivities with its foreland in the Eastern Ocean, historian Edward Alpers argues that continental oceanic interaction took place most crucially through Indian Ocean islands lying close to the East African Swahili coast, much like the Dakhlaks further north. These East African islands were suitable environments for the establishment of trader settlements, stepping stones for long distance travelers, bridgeheads for the Islamization of Swahili East Africa, staging posts for the overseas transfer of people enslaved, and later microcosms of colonial and post-colonial African history. A different tack along the route of Indian Ocean Island history goes through the study of medieval Arabic geographical and wonders literature, which conjures a different host of island worlds, utopian or dystopian places where normality is inverted in all sorts of ways. Islands that disappear, islands that float, islands with single gender populations, islands of cannibals, islands of pirates, and others with giant serpents guarding fields of precious jewels. Several of these motifs coalesce in the geographical figment of the Wakwak Island or islands, an insular place at the very edges of the Indian Ocean, a place present on maps and you see it here in the map we saw earlier uh, of the Alidrisi um, manuscript. Uh, this is Barbara, Zanj, and Sofala. These are well-known places where people go and travel to and so on. And right next to it at the end of land is the mythical Wakwak land, um, so this hybrid. So present on maps, yet explicitly utopian, and the original home of the Wakwak tree sometimes talking, a talking tree, and often, quite shockingly, bearing human and animal fruit. I can't talk more about the questions raised by the conceptual figure of these fascinating, distant, mysterious islands and their representation in word and image. That's another lecture, and I'm actually heading to a much more mundane place, unfortunately. But you can find the most exquisite um, visual distillation of the medieval traditions about the Wakwak Islands and Wakwak trees 
at the Museum für, the Museum für Islamische Kunst right here in Berlin. And I have to thank very much my um, friend and colleague, Julia Gonella, um, curator of Islamic art at the museum for providing me with information and with, with this wonderful image of this later um, representation of the medieval wak wak tree. What these fabular literary and visual islands have in common with more historically grounded ideas about island roles is the external gaze and an underlying understanding of islandness as isolation. Islands as, quote, bounded, isolated, and temporally distanced places. The notion of the prison island is an example of that idea. And there are countless cases in, global in the global history of islands serving as prisons and um, places of exile. This is true of the Dakhlaks, both before and after the rise of Islam in the region, uh, Christian Aksumite kings of Ethiopia and later Umayyad Abbasid caliphs used the island, uh, the Dakhlak islands as prisons and places of exile for political adversaries and other undesirables. You could say, following Michel Foucault, that already in that early period, the, or these early periods, the islands served as a literal archipel carceral, or a correctional archipelago. The idea is that island, the idea that islands make perfect prisons is indeed pervasive and diachronic. And this is why I'm showing you this strange uh, image here, which seems out of place. I was struck by this architectural proposal, the ocean platform prison, essentially a prison island that makes precisely that connection between islands and perfect prisons, um, even though th that is not explicitly stated in the project's design brief. It is important, however, to remember that islands are not prisons or any of the other things that I have been enumerating earlier, not inevitably and definitely not continuously. In a beautiful book about the colonial history of the Andaman Islands in the Bay of Bengal, historian Aparna Vaidik shows that British imperial descriptions of the Andamans as wild, isolated, and perfectly suited for the creation of a correctional facility were in fact part of a vision to forcibly appropriate space at the spreading empire's periphery with a view of expanding further. Again and again in the history of islands, we see that insularity is not about being cut off from the world, but rather entails a historically contingent balance between connectivity and isolation. For our case study, this translates into the question of when and how local realities on Dakhlak became inextricably intertwined with long distance trans-regional networks of politics and trade, and when and why regional and local networks took over instead. To show you how I go about, I'm beginning to go about answering these questions, now let's move in the second part of my talk to a few examples of the empirical data available, starting from outsiders looking in and moving to more local perspectives, closer to the Dakhlaks and backward in historical time. First, this beautiful 16th century map of the Western Indian Ocean from the so-called um, Queen Mary Atlas commissioned by Queen Mary of England and part of a series of Portland charts, the map shows us an essentially Iberian view of what since Vasco da Gama's first completed India voyage in 1498 had been for the Europeans the newly discovered, but in fact very old, world of the Indian o Ocean. Diogo Homain, the famous cartographer, Portuguese cartographer responsible for this masterpiece, clearly took care to render with colorful vividness the entire Red Sea, Mare Rubrum, as it is labeled right there. Um, a territory that had been the ultimate goal of crusading Europeans ever since the days of the infamous Reynald de Chatillon in the 12th century, and which in the first half of the 16th century, the Portuguese fought hard but failed to conquer. Within the Red Sea, note how carefully 
um, Diogo outlined the shape of the Dahlak archipelago, as well as the relative size and characteristic line, uh, outline of its uh, great island, Dahlak Kabir. And you see it right here, and I think by now you're becoming very familiar uh, with the, that outline. Uh, it's quite recognizable. The names of some of the other islands appear along with those of important anchorages and coastline features, such as promontories, capes, and bays, written perpendicularly to the line of the adjacent shore. So indeed, this is a very, um, it shows the intense navigational interest of the map makers. Surrounding the archipelago are places that mattered greatly for the ambitions of the nascent Portuguese seaborne empire, which was being brought into being by the informants of the map maker. Arabia Sterilis, right here, um, where the symbolic heart of Islam lay, meaning Mecca, the house of Mahomet, as uh, the uh, inscription in Latin tells us there, an ultimate goal of the renewed crusading fervor of the period. Arabia Felix. Yemen, with its strategic shores and ports and its remarkably fertile highlands. And the kingdom of Ethiopia, meaning the Christian state of the Ethiopian highlands. In the Middle Ages, and in response to the failures of the Crusades, Europeans had invented the uh, figure of a powerful Christian king of the Indies. This legendary Prester John, as he was known, was now equated more and more uh, with the real Ethiopian Christian dynasty, ascendant again in the 14th and 15th centuries, troubled in the 16th, whom the Portuguese had been courting as an ally in their quest for spices and world domination. The obscure toponyms of the Dahlak Islands are dwarfed by such place names of greater resonance and therefore in greater type. But these islands were, to the map makers and their patrons, stepping stones and potential, sent and potential sentinels on the way to crucial places. And the colorful visual language with which they are depicted reflects, it seems to me, their strategic importance to both the Portuguese and their competitors. Indeed, Salman Reis, an Ottoman commander leading the effort against the Portuguese in 1525, in a document that survives in the Ottoman archives, pleads for reinforcements amid strategic developments in the Red Sea, and devotes several lines of his report to the Dahlaks. The author cautions that if the infidel Portuguese were to succeed in their bid to capture and fortify Dahlak Kabir, the large island at the heart of the archipelago, they would come to control the entire Red Sea and its vital access to the Indian Ocean. He continues to say that the archipelago could be easy for the Ottomans to conquer because there was no one there. It's an island without a people. And to sweeten the deal, he emphasizes the archipelago's exquisite pearls that ostensibly nobody was harvesting. This is clearly a figment of the Ottoman commander's plea. The Portuguese, on their part, had made attempts to co-opt the islands, islanders, and in their reports make particular note of an island strongman, someone they call a sheikh, using the simple Arabic title of seniority and authority. But as we shall see in a bit, and actually as you've already heard um, uh, from Barry earlier, uh, this man in his own realm claimed to be not simply a sheikh, but a sultan, and the polity he commanded not merely an insular backwater, but a fagr, the Arabic term that in medieval times had come to denote a borderline a borderland between the territories ruled by Muslims and territories ruled by infidels. The deployment of such rhetoric of sovereignty and legitimacy has to be linked directly to the moment created by the complex of pragmatic and ideological interests that brought the Ottomans and the Portuguese to the region. Both the outsiders the Portuguese and the Ottomans, and the native potentate, the self-proclaimed sultan of the borderland of Dahlak, were attempting to capitalize on the archipelago's position as a navigational hotspot of the Red Sea. Looking beyond this era of generalized conflict, ushered by the advent of Western Europeans and Ottomans in Eastern seas, we find Dahlak serving as a stepping stone 
on trade routes between the Indian Ocean and the Mediterranean and between East Africa and Arabia. This partly, but not exclusively, thanks to its navigational uh, centrality. While winds and currents made it expedient to stop here, the development of a local market and the rendition of market and shipping services, presumably by locally rooted individuals, amplified the advantages of geographical location and maritime topography. Evidence for this comes from uh, the letter that I started my talk with. So let's move back from the 16th to the 12th century. You recall a Judeo-Arabic business letter written by a Jewish merchant to an associate and reporting about a shipwreck and the salvage of merchandise. We have to imagine here local sailors and fishermen spotting the shipwreck somewhere in that maze of islands that we saw earlier and notifying others at the archipelago's main port. You have to imagine boatmen and divers setting out from there to salvage the merchandise, certainly for a fee. Porters and warehouse workers airing and drying the salvaged merchandise on the beach before repacking it and loading it onto further ships to go on uh, its way. So other letters and legal documents, the first one was a letter that I showed you, this one is a legal document, reveal additional cases of shipwrecked merchants and merchandise, and the adjudication of estates of merchants that were not as lucky as our Abu Ishaq. Further documents also provide glimpses of merchants routinely finding on Dakhlaq a lively market for Egyptian cloth, for Mediterranean storax, which is an aromatic resin used in the perfume making industry, local marine products, including one that is a mystery product special to the archipelago. Um, I'm not sure what it is, but it's mentioned in many of these letters. And also a partly monetized system of exchange, perhaps including a local um, a, a coin, a local, locally struck coinage. Extraction of customs taxes appear routine, although in a couple of cases we see both cheating, even upstanding businessmen are known to occasionally pay a bribe to the customs official, and forceful extractions from the local authorities, by the local authorities. Such, such instances of transgression and rapacity aside, the merchant's documents thus reveal that Dakhlak was a marketplace with routine services and fairly predictable institutions, and even a polity with active participation in overseas trading networks. The document repository to which these business documents belong reveals something about the composition of the networks of trade passing through the insular crossroads of the Red Sea and about the identity of the participants. And this is the Cairo Geniza uh, uh, corpus that uh, Barry mentioned in his introduction. This unique corpus, um, known as the Documentary Cairo Geniza, comprises personal, business, and communal documents belonging to members of, Ky of Cairo's very old Jewish community and originally deposited, stored, and sealed in a synagogue in Old Cairo, continuously, though not systematically, between the 10th and 13th centuries, with some later sporadic deposits, until their somewhat chance rediscovery in the 19th century. Letters, shopping lists, IOUs, receipts, recipes, and some legal documents were written primarily in Judeo-Arabic, Arabic language written in the Hebrew script and therefore representative of this particular speech community of Arabic-speaking um, uh, Jews uh, living in um, uh, Islamic, in, uh, in Muslim-led um, Arab-speaking contexts. In addition to, generally speaking, of a variety of Jewish actors routinely embedded in most aspects of social, economic, and even political life of these Muslim-led states, the business materials in the Cairo Geniza reveal the specific ways religious and ethnic identity featured, or more commonly became elided, in the routine business of commerce, especially the trans-regional commerce of the Indian Ocean. At Dakhlak and at the Southern Red Sea, more broadly speaking, the business associates who appear on the pages of the relevant Geniza documents include, and here I'm enumerating the designations used in the documents themselves, 
Egyptians, Yemenis, East Africans, Indians, Abyssinians, Jews, Muslims, Christians, merchants, captains, ship owners, and rulers. Thus, these fortuitously preserved fragments of history draw our attention away from the grand narratives and ideological discourse about identity and towards the much more complex and fluid realities of self and other negotiation on the ground. Or as novelist Amitav Ghosh has put it, and I quote, they open a trapdoor into a network of foxholes where real life continues uninterrupted. End of quote. Finally, let me turn to a different set of sources emanating from the heart of the archipelago itself. The homonymous Big Island harbors an impressive yet relatively poorly known remain, uh, sorry, the impressive but yet relatively poorly known remains of a medieval and post-medieval settlement. Located directly on the water, the town of Dahlak Kabir, where our 12th century Jewish merchants' merchandise must have been taken after salvage, sprawls today in substantial ruins of houses built of coral blocks, some of which are partly reused today. And the settlement is right here. Uh, here you see a sketch from the latest, uh, most recent archaeological survey by uh, Timothy Insel just a sketch of the site, and here you see some images of uh, the site itself. These are um, part of the coral built habitations, a t probably a tomb from the cemetery that I'm going to talk about um, in a second. Pottery and small finds sampled on the ground will eventually tell the story of the medieval site's regional and trans-regional connections, as well as of local industry and manufacture. Locally made beads, glass cullet of a long abandoned local glass making kiln, mother of pearl objects, perhaps also locally made for pearl oysters from pearl oysters fished in the archipelago and destined for the overseas market. Pending a more thorough investigation and perhaps excavation here, the story of this site's identity is told primarily by the tombstones found in the extensive cemetery stretching northwest of the port. The corpus of some 273 tombstone inscriptions gives the names of people from different walks of life. And here you see one of these tombstones in situ and another one long removed due to the vagaries of colonial um, presence in the Southern Red Sea. The corpus includes the tombstones of an island elite who called themselves sultans. From the 11th century on, the Sunni Islamic title of supreme uh, earthly sovereignty. The titulature attested by this headstone speaks not only to the assertive political self-fashioning of the Dakhlaki potentates, but also possibly implicates the island dynasty into more generalized bids for political legitimacy in the course of the late 11th and 12th centuries. The context here is the so-called Sunni resurgence, when the Shia authority of the Fatimids in Egypt was waning under the stress of competition with the newly emergent and assertively Sunni authority of, Seljuk, of the Seljuk Turkic Empire, the antagonism of the Crusades, and internal dynastic rifts. The rhetoric of the titles on the island strongmen's tombstones is expansive and instructive. Nasser al-Islam, defender of Islam, Athagri al-Islami, the border guard of Islam, Is al-Islam wal-Muslimin, the glory of Islam and the Muslims, Jamal al-Salatin, the ornament of the sultans. Such claims, and, and the term sultan in and of itself is, is important here. Such claims and alignment with political trends of the wider region is an impressive token of the ways in which the local and the trans-regional contexts intersect in the politics of Dahlak. From chronicles and documentary sources, such as Geniza letters, we know that beyond rhetoric, these local potentates sealed their alliances and strengthened their positions vis-a-vis -vis expansive regional powers by the giving of gifts. The gifts included both local Red Sea marine products as well as exotic animals from the uh, East African coast, no more than 30 miles away, notably elephants and giraffes, as well as animal skins. 
Most crucially, however, the exchange between the Lachlaki rulers and the great sovereigns of Egypt and Yemen relied on tribute in human souls and the eastward traffic of enslaved people from Nubia, Sudan, and Ethiopia. Channeled through the islands between the 10th and the 15th centuries, slaves played a tremendously important role in the formation of strong ties between the archipelago and its forelands in Yemen and in East Africa, engendering a distinct set of local and regional dynamics. One, exa one example, one that highlights the complexities of the slave trade and the institution of slavery in medieval Indian Ocean contexts. According to the Yemeni chronicle, chronicler Omar al-Hakami, already in the 10th century, the Ziyadid dynasty, ruling most of coastal Yemen, received tribute from the ruler of Dahlak in the form of a thousand slaves from Nubia and from Ethiopia. It was a clan of such slaves, recruited and trained as military personnel, that effectively ended their master's rule and installed its own members as rulers over the South Arabian Muslim-led state and its capital in Zabid. These new dynasts, the Najahids, and you see there their dynastic tree, themselves recruited other enslaved people, not only from East Africa, but as far afield as India, most remarkably a um, future queen and queen mother, thus creating a truly interregional network of genealogy and power. Throughout their rule in the 11th and 12th centuries, the Najahids maintained their contacts with the Dahlaks and used the islands as refuge at least twice when temporarily dislodged from their seat of power in Zabid by the rival uh, potentates in Yemen. These intimate and dynamic exchanges across the Red Sea illuminate the realities of the regional slave trade and its ramifications and implicate the archipelago and its local rulers in the power plays of the region in one more um, way. Finally, to conclude with a note about inside and outside perspectives on this and other island histories. Indeed, that was an apt and true reply, which was given to Alexander the Great by a pirate who had been seized. For when the king asked the man what he meant by keeping hostile possession of the sea, the pirate answered with bold pride, what do you mean by taking hostile possession of the whole world? Because I do it with a petty ship, I am called a robber, while you who does it with a great fleet are called an emperor. To historians of the Atlantic and the Mediterranean worlds who are interested in the widespread and varied phenomenon of maritime predation, this famous passage from the great Western Christian theologians, City of God, encapsulates the political and social struggles and legal ambiguities implicated in definitions of piracy. Today, anti-copyright activists and a variety of political critics, see Noam Chomsky's The Emperor and the Pirate, find in Augustine's spirited pirate a stirring spokesman for the critique against the self-righteous dictates of the powerful and the attendant claims of moral authority. But I conclude with this famous and very productive piece of didactic historical realism by Augustine to simply make one last point that the Dahlak polity's islandness and relative smallness, its location outside the more or less firmly controlled territories of land-based states and away from metropolitan centers that produced the surviving narratives, as well as its particularly maritime character, made it and many others like it easy to discursively ignore or explicitly brand and dismiss in contemporary and near contemporary annals of history produced at these more distant cosmopolitan places and surviving to these days as our main um, uh, written sources, uh, historical sources. I will follow my love, says the 12th century poet Ibn Mekdam, even if her residence were in Dahlak. <laughs> The island was used as a prison of the Umayyads and the Abbasids, says the traveler Ibn al-Mujawir, and then he moves on. The island is a living hell, and its king is the angel of hell, says Alexandrian poet Ibn Khalakis, who shipwrecked in the archipelago in the 12th century and clearly hated the place, although he found patronage with the local ruler. 
Modern historians have taken these metrocentric voices a little too much at their word, and at times have even amplified the characterization of marginality, describing Dahlak as the seat of, quote, dangerous pirates, the realm of, quote, pirate emirs, or simply the domain of, quote, petty kings, or at least a place on the way to somewhere else, always something in between. But examined more thoroughly, from the variety of sources and from an essentially different maritime perspective, the story of Dahlak is not singularly about predatory behavior of local strongmen or only about extraction of rent or networks of traders passing through or expansionist states fighting for territory at their borders or the slave trade, but rather about all of these strands woven together with the lives of the islanders themselves lives lived in and from their protected, connected, and rich maritime world. Thank you very much. Thank you. And please, if there are any questions, I'm very happy to answer them. Yes, Robin. The answer to this question might simply be uh, no. I don't know. <laughs> but, um, but I wonder if we have much sense about how the Dahlakians uh, in the period that you're talking about uh, thought of themselves. That is to say, did they think of themselves as uh, subjects of the Sultan of Dahlak? That is to say, were they Dahlakians? Um, I mean, is that how they thought of themselves? Did they think of themselves as somewhat remote subjects of the Sultan in Istanbul? Did they think of themselves as, if they, if they, if they thought of themselves as being on the thagar, as you say, on the frontier, were they um, constantly thinking of themselves in contrast to Christians across the, across the waters? Right, so that's, that's, a, that's a great question that I've been asking too. And of course, it's different in each. And um, the answer in it's, it's, it's almost no, although there are some ways of getting to that, perhaps. Uh, one of them is through a thorough study of the, um, tomb, the inscriptions on the tombstone. So we have the epithet Tahlaki appearing there. Um, but uh, it doesn't appear uh, very much, and, but that's, that's, a, that's a way of tracing um, that, 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 that idea of belonging to the place. So that's one way to, to, to think about it. Um, otherwise, we have mostly the voices of outsiders, um, seeing them as uh, petty vassals at best, for the most part. So the, the one way in is through the inscriptions for now. Um, this is sort of a periphery question. Uh, when the Najahids took over in Zabid, what happened to the slave trade, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the Najahid dynasty itself? Do you have? I mean, I know this is out, potentially outside the scope of your study. No, it's not. It's not outside, and okay. I'm, but I'm still. It's it's a very good. It's still, um, as far as I understand, the traffic continues. So there are more. Um, uh, um, there are there are more slaves coming from across the Red Sea. Um, again, uh, the difficulty here is. There, there is one chronicle that documents this, and it's a chronicle that comes from a later period, slightly later, a few decades later after the fall of the dynasty. Um, so I, I don't know exactly to what extent that continues. We do know that there is um, th there is there is there are uh, also uh, slaves coming from other parts of the Indian Ocean at this time into into the. Yeah. I think so, yes. Yeah, I think so. Yes, Barry. Oh, Teaching one of the interesting broader methodological 
aspects of what you're trying to do? Is it you're working with very little hard data and you're trying to reconstruct this peripheral world which is actually fairly central? Um, and thinking of the, the tombstones, which are remarkable, um, usually when uh, historians use that kind of data, they go straight for the semantic context. So they yeah. extract the, you know, the dates, the names, and they pay no attention to materiality, to the epigraphy, to the style of writing, to the, you know, all of that. And looking at those, they're immediately, it, you can see immediately that they are identical to the tombstones that have been produced in Mecca in the same period. So right. these are really, these are not peripheral, high these are high-end high end tombstones. Yes. Right. Um, so I'm wondering, I know that, that there's the Schneider um, publication, all these tombstones, mm -hmm. do they pay attention to things like epigraphy, like the connections with Mecca or... Uh, yes, so yeah. Schneider does to, to, to a large extent, uh, also looks at the lapidaries, the, 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 the makers of these. Um, but yes, this is an important strand to tie uh, what's happening locally with these broader networks. Um, I, th there are, I think there are also more tombstones on the, on the island that have to be still examined. Um, and the stone is local stone? The stone is, uh, some of it is local and some of it is imported. So I, she 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 talks about both. Yeah. I really enjoyed your talk, Erksani. Sorry you. for all the Thank coffee. Um, in um, in terms of island history, of how to um, think of it historically, you're playing with this idea of of uh, continuity and then change as a result of um, wider flows, and it made me think. Uh, first of um, Marshall Salins's book, Islands um, of, of History, which is written in some ways against the Brodelian view, where instead of continuity, he looks at an, uh, at an island, which in this case is discovered by Captain Cook with the idea that everything changes as a result of that um, encounter. Right. But um, the setup is too neat for historians, of course. But I was wondering, in your case, what would mark um, the narrative? How do you decide on a beginning point and on an ending point for the history? What, what, what marks what you look for in terms of change in a place that um, is continuously, in fact, subject to flows from both um, you know, around the Ethiopian coast and, and Arabia. So that's one general question. And the other one, just I'm curious, uh, and it may be connected to this, incidentally. You mentioned the Dahlaki language, about which I'd never even heard of. And I wonder, does that provide any clues as to uh, wider flows and the influence of Ethiopic or Arabic? Or what, what can you do with the language itself to talk about the relative isolation and continuity of the place? Right, so let me answer the second one first. Uh, so in this work, I really rely on the work of many people uh, that, that, um, and, and expertises that really are not mine. So uh, the linguistic study of this dialect is um, uh, one that's ongoing now. And so I, I, I rely on the two scholars who are, are, are studying the language to um, understand precisely the question you ask, how far back does this, um, uh, does, does this linguistic process that the language attests, the language today attests to goes? So what does it tell us? Does it tell us that, it that there was a moment of creolization? I think in the text I, um, uh, was a little bit too, uh, uh, um, um, uh, I, I, I said it a little bit too definitely that this is a, a process of creolization that uh, happens, but this is still something that's, that's um, a question out there. And to what extent, um, what does, how can we tell what are the constituents of this um, uh, process of, 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 so that's still to be determined. Um, what is very clear is that uh, the language which was originally thought of as a dialect of Tigre, which is the, um, 
um, the North Ethiopic language of the coast uh, that is pr predominantly spoken on the coast, coast uh, of uh, modern day Eritrea uh, was that the Dahalik language was simply a dialect of that. Uh, now, more and more, it looks like it has enough distance from it to have developed independently at some point in time. So there's a strong connection with the coast, very clearly, but then there's that development uh, which includes quite extensive Arabic lexicon. So, um, yes, so these are the constituents. Now, how far back in time does this go, and what does it tell us exactly about the uh, connection is, is something still to be determined. Um, so the points of change, uh, because I did say, right, that, that the um, local, uh, at least in terms of the local elite, uh, and to some extent the local economy seems to be responding to um, these outside uh, uh, stimuli, right? Um, so the change that I'm going to look for, and which I, I didn't talk about here at all, is those moments where we don't have as intense an interaction with the outside. Um, when things are becoming more local and more regional. Um, so the moments in between. And, and, and this is something I'm interested in showing, right? That it's not always about what's happening outside, but that there are other periods, long periods of time when we have a, a different um, set of circumstances that are more local. And I'm still working on that. So uh, partly inspired by a, a work um, about the Greek island of Delos, which was a great center of pilgrimage. And we think about it in the, in the ancient world. It was also a great center of commerce in the ancient world. And we think about it as very connected and constantly a place where people were coming to and so on. But there, there, then there were 150 years um, in between uh, uh, the Hellenistic and Roman period where it really, we can really show uh, a very localized economy that cut its ties from the outside. Um, and so these changes and the um, reliance on the local environment and local traditional economy as opposed to overseas networks is, it interests me a lot. So that's what I'm looking for. Yes. Brenda. Thank you, Raksani. That was a wonderful talk. Um, I have a question, though, about um, something that you didn't talk about, but I know you probably are working on, which is the ordinary person who lives on in this on this island, on these groups of islands. So, I particularly, I'm interested in you know a family. If a, f a family that lived there, men, women, children, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what was an ordinary day in their lives like? And I'm so intrigued because the food was so wonderful that we had for dinner. And I'm wondering, okay, did ordinary people eat this? Was this just inspired? I mean, can you just tell us something about the kind of social history of the ordinary people who lived there, who didn't sort of necessarily travel you know, from place to place, but who lived there at a particular time? You choose the time. Right, okay. so so for for the very important centuries of the 12th and the 13th century, we have, and for the Red Sea, the southern half of the Red Sea, well, the Red Sea, more broadly speaking, we have um, data uh, from an archaeological excavation, a very, a very um, um, important and thorough archaeological excavation um, in southern Egypt. Uh, for Dakhlak itself, we would know more about um, diet and daily life um, in that material sense. Uh, I'm not sure about the social sense so much, but in the material sense, uh, and then its, it's ramifications for the social um, 
for social life. Uh, if we had a thorough excavation of this uh, um, extensive site that I have shown, but I'm a little bit careful with advocating that because this is a place where people still live, or at least part of the of, of the site is still inhabited, or um, some of these buildings are still used in some way. So. Um, uh, although I would love to see a big excavation um, excavating the remains and maybe um, getting to the archaeobotanical remains that would give you um, uh, possibly um, elements to reconstruct a diet, I am not going to quite advocate that yet without knowing what, yes. <laughs> I'm interested in the role of accident in this type of history, and especially the shipwreck mm -hmm. uh, that actually did not have the happy ending, uh, like the one mm -hmm. in your letter, but actually stayed there mm -hmm. for decades, for centuries, etc. In fact, it would be very interesting to know what happens to those that the objects that perhaps are saved, but they're stolen, etc., and they are somehow integrated with, you know, the local culture. So uh, what does it mean for an object that, uh, you know, it was, dest it was not destined to stay there? And what, uh, what is finally its, you know, its uh, sort of legacy f for the people of the island or the local culture when, um, you know, accidentally becomes part of it? Right? Uh, mm -hmm. So the artifacts, that, the ones that you showed, they were from Egypt, they were from China, and they would just happen to cross Mm -hmm. from there, but they happen to stay. Right. Right. So I think that entirely challenges notions of, you know, the local, the indigenous, the native, uh, that somehow accidentally it uh, has an encounter with cultures that they were simply meant to pass by, and yet they stayed. Right. So uh, at one level, the accidental really gives us a big part of this history, the preservation of these um, documents that I have shown you, the Judeo-Arabic documents, is uh, it, it's not it's not entirely. There was a logic to why they were deposited, um, and to some extent, there is a logic to how many of them got preserved. But ultimately, it's haphazard what we have. The sample that we have is to some extent haphazard. So um, I'm not answering your question in terms of something that stayed there, uh, because I'm trying to think how. It's a, it's a, it's a very good question. But, but, but the accidental that gives us a part of that history. Well, an accident is of the accident, actually. Right, yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, in terms of things that uh, uh, stay there and become incorporated, Um, you know, things became incorporated not out of accident, but because this was a stopping point on a trade route. So things that were going somewhere else also partly stayed there um, and became part of the ornaments and so on. Yes, Barry. This does help you. You think it terms less of objects of the people who stayed there, right. as to who died who there. And That's, you think in terms of the toponymics of the thing. So this is a tombstone of somebody. The name would suggest that the family or he came from the Persian. Kais, exactly. So does yeah. that, would that help? That would help. A, that helps a lot, actually. And I was thinking that maybe there's a way to uh, plot this network. So basically, these these tombstones, the epithets, the the parts of the names, give us sometimes an origin. Now we don't know if that's necessarily the origin of the person. Um, the immediate origin of the person or a distant origin of an ancestor of the person. So that's often a bit of a tangle in using these Arabic epithets to say something. But it tells you something about where people are connected to. So I think having a sort of a, 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 um, um, a kind of just even graphically representing where all these nispas are referring to um, on the tombstones. So yeah, that's an, that's another way to, to get to it. Thank you, Julia. Oh, uh, Julia, can yeah. I have two questions. 
One question is connected with your last. Yeah. Do we know about the Dahlaki community somewhere else in the Indian Ocean? One question. Oh, that's a great question. And the second question is, um, in fact, do we have, I think we talked about this, but the, I would like you to illuminate on this. Do we have any remains? I mean, standing houses, harbors, people on Dachlak Islands? I mean, is there oral history, for example? Uh, or um, do we know where these people come from? I know from Sri Lanka. In Sri Lanka, we have uh, a very, very strong Muslim communities, for example, and they are twofold. And uh, one is connected with the early Arab travelers. And they, um, I think in their history, they go back to, you know, mm -hmm. that they Different. come yeah. from somewhere further west. While there is the other Indonesian-connected Muslim community, and they connect themselves towards the east. And they today dress differently and have different habits and have different, I don't know, sort of marry differently and so on and so on. And I wonder, yeah, I mean, do we, would that not be an interesting addition to historical research if one include, included, A, the sort of material culture, of, co of course, I mean, I'm coming from the material culture person, but also the ethnographic um, history, the oral history, or... Yeah. Right, yeah, I think the oral history is, to some extent, a, a, Something that um, the, the linguists who are working on the local language uh, are going to be producing, um, sort of, or recording um, stories um, in the local language about the place. But this doesn't, doesn't exist that I have access to right now. Um, and uh, the other point was uh, a Dakhlaki uh, diaspora in the Indian Ocean. Not that I know of, but if anybody hears of anything, please let me know. <laughs> yes. One more. Last. You get the last. Thank you, Roxanne. That was great talk, and uh, I'm just brimming with this fascinating world that you've put forward here. And I'm wondering about two component parts, not two questions, two components. Two parts, OK. Uh, but if you don't answer what you want. The technology of the time and place. Um, and of course, you're, you've talked about it. It's changed over the centuries. So how, what, was there much change to the technology, particularly you know, if you look at the European world, there's a big time change in technology of, of in navigation, seafaring, and other types of tools that were being created. Do we see a complementary type of change in this part of the world at that particular time? And then also, I'm wondering about systems of governance. Like, so let's say you were a trader starting at the at the t northern part of the Red Sea and sailing down through that Red Sea out into the Arabian Sea and the Indian Ocean, how many different jurisdictions are you going through, uh, including piracy, is its own jurisdiction, that you have to be aware of, that you have to be savvy about, to negotiate through, either paying bribes or paying uh, some sort of uh, fees or whatever to get through, you know, whatever type of tolls are being charged for that, that part of the ge geography. I mean, what would it have been like for a trader trying to sail through that? Right, so I think I'm just going to answer a little bit your, the second part, That's and fine. then the rest we can discuss the technology Over dinner. we can discuss later. <laughs> uh, but uh, in, in, in terms of uh, the polities involved, yes, there were many different uh, 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 polities that held on to different parts of the system. And uh, the traders who were passing through were conversant with the institutions um, of these different places. And, um, and, and, and often they were prepared to adapt themselves to different legal regimes that applied in these in these different places. How many different languages would there have been from nor Northern Red Sea out into the Arabian Sea? How many different languages are they passing through? Um, I mean, just uh, yeah, I'm trying to, to, to remember. I counted all the languages that would have, that traders would have encountered in the different ports sailing from um, 
the, the Red Sea to, to India, and um, uh, there were many. Yeah. But <laughs> more than 20. Right. Wow. So, uh, thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank everybody. You